You're with me, it's alright Together, all our lives A new star is inside We're falling, it feels right It's okay to hold me Hello, everybody. Welcome to another special episode of the Nicholas Snow Show on the Promo Homo TV network. I'm so excited you could join us. You know, some of the things that many of us have in common is that when we came out, one of the places we were able to find ourselves um, were gay bars. Of course, I ultimately found myself uh, in sobriety, which is another story. But uh, I, I so value these spaces that were available to me. And on my show today, I'm so excited to welcome Art Smith, who's going to be telling us about the Gay Barchives Project, which is uh, a, a really an amazing uh, effort to build the world's largest archive of logos and, logos and stories of gay bars from the past, preserving the memories of the places that were so significant to the growth and development of the LGBTQ plus community. And as Art, uh, my guest explains, to date uh, they have commemorated more than 1,000 bars and nightclubs from more than 35 states in the U.S., along with several in Canada and Europe. And he invites you to enjoy the trip down memory lane as you relieve, relive our LGBTQ history through some of the stories of our safe havens. And GayBarchives.com actually lives on channel 125.com. We're going to talk about that as well. It's been around for 20 years. I thought that it was as new as the Gay Barchives Project, but in fact, it's been around for about 20 years. And it's an internet internet-based video channel featuring thousands of original videos covering a wide array of topics, including entertainment, politics, and LGBT issues. So that's what's coming up in the show today. As many of you know, with the fall season, I launched the ability for people to subscribe to Homo, uh, Homo Promo, Promo Homo TV for as little as $3 a month. You can see the text above my head that, that takes you to the place where you can do that. But I want to thank my initial patrons, Brad Fur, G. Francis Giles, and Ron DeHart, because every little bit helps. And as uh, more and more people patronize my efforts, I can do better and better work reaching a bigger and uh, more enthusiastic audience. So I look forward to that. And I look forward to welcoming Art Smith to the show after this. You win me. 
so great that you've joined me. I want to let you know that if you're watching live and comment or ask a question, we may put you on screen just like this. And I love being able to interact with my live viewers um, if you're there and watching live. Uh, so without further delay, I want to welcome to the show Art Smith. Hello, Art. How are you? Hello, Nicholas. Excellent. I'm really happy to be here today. Well, I'm very happy that you're here. It's really quite fantastic. And uh, one of the things that I was really particularly uh, excited to learn uh, on the surface, the Gabe Archives project, uh, I thought was simply a collection of logos. But in speaking with you recently, I was really excited to learn that it's a deep dive into the history and the logos are just really at the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Right. I started um, with the logos because, in, you know, as you know, people respond to visual input. Um, you can write a 10,000-word essay. Nobody's going to look at it. But if it has an eye-catching graphic that brings back a memory, then they may delve into it a little bit more. Um, plus, the, the logos are really what's disappearing the fastest because they were never preserved or archived to begin with. So... I've been working on that pretty exclusively since um, since this whole COVID lockdown started. Well, my audience is now being hypnotized by the screen behind you with all the logos, but I'm putting up uh, both of your website addresses, gaybarchives.com and channel125.com. Um, which uh, speaks to your history in our movement and documenting it. I was wondering if you would talk about your involvement with Channel125.com over the decades. So actually, um, my involvement with documenting mm -hmm. and um, being involved with the gay media goes even further back than that. Um, back in the 80s, I was tapped by a publisher in Atlanta to take over a um, monthly gay nightlife publication there. And that's kind of what started. Which one, in, which one was late it? 80s. The original, uh, the original one was called The Guide. And there were several of them around the country. I think there was one in Seattle, one in Boston. Uh, they were kind of a franchise type publication that was published monthly in standard magazine size, eight and a half by 11. Um, and when I started doing that, when I agreed to take that position, it put me in the position of every time I went out to meet a potential advertiser or to talk to somebody about the publication in the late 80s, I was forced to have to say basically, hi, I'm Art and I'm gay. Because I was representing a gay publication and that basically outs you automatically. Um, but that went on for years. I was involved with several publications in Atlanta uh, when I moved to Florida, I was involved with Watermark here, 
writing the nightlife column. Um, I've only been involved with Channel 125 for about seven or eight years. Um, when I moved back to Atlanta in 2013, um, a prominent lesbian in the gay community there um, introduced me to Dick Wolfley. And he had started uh, Channel 125 about 20 years ago. And we immediately hit it off and started doing some different types of programming. We have a program that's got some episodes online called Deja Gay, which talks about old gay stuff in general, not the bar scene. I love um, that name. We have a gay view, which is kind of like a view of opinionated you know, local people talking about topics. So it, I've been involved with them for about seven or eight years. Well, I want to just give a shout out to Dick um, and apologize because somehow I thought that this was one of your creations and it was recent and it's really great that Dick has been doing this. And Dick, come on my show and talk about it uh, in the future by all means. Um, I started my own document, document my own, I, I like to call myself a multimedia entertainment activist, but I started my activism in the early to mid 80s uh, in Arizona. And I have such uh, respect for people that have been doing this for decades at such a public level because everyone that stepped onto the front lines in one way or another has uh, been a significant part in creating the world that we have today. Did you consider yourself an activist at the time doing what you were doing? Um, not really. Um, it, it just seemed like I was, you know, using today's terminology. It seemed to me back then that I was just kind of embracing my authentic self. I wasn't, you know, I've always been involved in some level of journalism. I started a newspaper in a private school I went to in second grade. So I've always been involved in the media on some level. But um, I just felt like when I, when I went out there and started meeting people and interacting with the community, I felt like I had some sort of a purpose and I was being able to be true to who I was as opposed to hiding in the shadows and pretending to be, you know, part of the mainstream uh, society. And so I didn't really consider it activism, but. So the first, the first bar that I was, that I ever went to, uh, the first gay bar um, uh, I ever went to was called Farah's Nightclub. And I went there um, way too early on the probably the wrong night of the week. Well, maybe I actually did make it there on a weekend night. And I got there way too early and I, I walked in and sat at the bar and looked away and was just like so shocked to see same sex couples dancing. And I think I just hit at the Pac-Man machine for a while and I don't think I stayed very long. But uh, many of us, have similar stories. Do you recall your your similar story? Absolutely. Um, in fact, it's mentioned in the listing for that particular bar. Um, so back in the 70s, um, when I was in high school, I had a boyfriend and we went off to college separately. He went to Maryland. I went to Massachusetts the first year. And um, I was down in Maryland visiting him and we went out to dinner and then he said well let's go down the street here and we'll go to a club and have a drink and so we walked into this bar and we're standing there i have a drink in my hand i'm standing at the railing overlooking the dance floor and it took me about i don't know four or five minutes to realize that everybody on the dance floor is male and um i suddenly had this realization that wow you know there are places that cater to people like Mark and I. And uh, it was the Hippo in Baltimore, which turned out to be an iconic bar that only recently closed, I think, four or five years ago. So that bar was open for probably 40 years. Um, but yeah, it was. I do remember that night very succinctly. Uh, well, of course, of, of course you would. Um, I'm actually going to bring up uh, your website, gaybarchives.com, uh, so we could just take a quick look at it. So I love the homepage um, where you have your mission statement. 
the world's largest collection of gay bars, logos, and stories. And of course, your company is, uh, is what's the name of your company, WOW? The WOW Biz is, yes, it's another website that I have, and it has other gay products on there as well. Um, I had designed a whole bunch of LGBT affirmative t-shirts and things like that, and they're all okay. on the all right, so then there's the there's the story of uh, the archives project, and the bars themselves are here. And what I love is that you have the listings broken down into states. Um, so, for example, on the screen is Arizona, and it says Tucson H T O. Does that H two O? Does that mean that you're only listing so far from Arizona? Is that bar? That is correct. Oh, Arizona, um, you got to get on the stick. I don't live there right now, but that's where all the, all my uh, coming out experiences uh, happen. The problem has been, um, the problem has been that, uh, you know, I'm not traveling around the country going to each of the the different gay centers in the different cities. So and people just don't is, people don't know about it yet, right? Well, and and what I'm trying to do is. I'm working with a lot of online archives. Um, you know, I know you've mentioned the uh, USC One Archive, but there's a huge archive um, in uh, Wisconsin, actually, surprisingly. Um, there's a huge one out of Houston. And so when the information is, is possible to find online, and I can know the names of the bars, and they have active groups on Facebook or whatever, um, it makes it easier for me to find the information. And so initially, that's what I've been working with um, is, you know, the different LGBT groups on Facebook that I'll post in and people say, oh, this bar from, you know, Tucson or whatever, and then I'll go look for it. But uh, there's no real national directory of gay bars that used to exist that I know of. So uh, on the... Uh website you have a contact us option it's very prominent at the website so anybody from anywhere in the world that wants to contribute to the project can just go to gaybarchives.com and use the contact info to reach out to art um, because really this isn't something you're going to be able to accomplish on your own you're going to really need the, the publicity and subsequent support to uh, create this deep archives that you want. Tell me about how it ties into the storytelling, which really is going to take a lot more time and effort. Um, oh, and Dick uh, from channel uh, 125 says, I think there should be a coffee table book. I can see that as well, Dick. Um, a combination of the logos with uh, stories, I think, would be spectacular. Uh, but um, tell me about how you're actually capturing this deep history in terms of the interview side of the project. So I'm doing it in a couple of ways. In some of the archives, there are um, links to newspaper articles or even on the Internet directly. If you know of a bar that existed and you type in in Google, uh, Eagle Fort Lauderdale, for example, uh, you may get some articles in there, and then I can read the articles and glean some of the history from there. Uh, also in some of the, again, the Facebook groups, I've had people reach out to me and say, oh, well, I remember the day that, you know, such and such happened when Madonna came in unexpectedly uh, right around the time of the sex book and did a little performance impromptu on stage. And so you get them that way too. Uh, and I capture those comments and put them into folders. My computer has a bazillion folders for uh, gay bars sorted by state and city and, and name that um, I can put all those into. And I'm slowly going through those and adding that information um, to them. But there's quite a bit out there. For instance, there was one guy, um, I had a conversation the other night with uh, Alan Kachin, who was the guy that brought the Eagle Bar to Fort Lauderdale. And it closed not too long ago, um, but he's looking to possibly reopen 
another uh, eagle in Fort Lauderdale. But he was also the guy behind a bar called Equus in Philadelphia, which was an iconic bar back in the 70s, back there. And Equus, uh, interestingly enough, is the only gay bar I've discovered so far that actually had a legitimate Godiva chocolate franchise and a storefront inside their bar. So you could go there and have a cocktail and dance with your boyfriend and then grab a few Godiva truffles on the way out the door. Um, one of the things I was doing while you were talking, uh, I was Googling because another really powerful memory I have in uh, Arizona was the Connection Gay Bar. And I wanted to make sure I was remembering the name of the owner correctly, Dale Williams. And um, I want to quote from uh, a story in Echo Magazine published um, in January of 2016. Um, uh, there was, uh, I'm going to click through here. Anyway, Dale Williams was the owner of The Connection. I'm clicking through to see if I can get to the actual story. But the reason that I wanted to reference uh, that bar was one of the things that I remember very clearly was every year Dale would have an annual luau where he would he would bring in tons of sand and convert his parking lot and this big back area into this giant lagoon with a pond and a bridge and um one year he brought in uh the weather girls to sing it's raining men and, and of course in the early 80s this would be at the height uh, of their um uh, you know they were still they're they're still Martha Wash is around today bless her heart and doing great work but uh, that's one of the examples of the things that I remember another powerful memory associated with a, a gay bar yeah there were um, things were a lot different then and back especially in the mid 70s into the 80s uh, there are quite a few of what I would call mega bars that were um, just regionally, such a draw. Um, you know, the, the bar that started this whole project uh, was Backstreet in Atlanta. And I did a commemorative shirt for them um, late last year. Raised money for the Atlanta Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. But Backstreet was a multi level, uh, multi purpose bar with everything from kind of a leather Levi area to a cabaret showroom to a gigantic dance floor downstairs. Um, and it lasted about 30 years in Atlanta. But, um, and at the end, the last half of its life, it was open 24 hours a day. It never closed and never stopped serving alcohol. So, well, uh, uh, other bars that are no longer with us is uh, Studio One in L.A. and the Rose Tattoo, uh, which I have memories of. I'm starting to feel very old. Um, <laughs> Dick uh, Dick has a question for you, and uh, he wants to know, who are some of the bar owners you've had contact with? You've mentioned some, but why don't you talk about some others? Well, there were quite a few. Like I said, with Backstreet, I coordinated the project of doing the commemorative design with Vicki Vera, who uh, she and her brother Henry uh, ran Backstreet in Atlanta, as well as the Backstreet in Fort Lauderdale. Um, and she's still around. I talk to her every now and again, mostly through Facebook. Um, the next group of bars that I started working, you know, focusing on getting the information for was another friend of mine from Atlanta uh, by the name of Luis Petrini, who owned Colorbox, uh, Velvet, Rio, several different bars there. If you remember, um, Rio was the bar that was involved in the case where Rob Lowe got busted on his underage sex guard with the video. Um, so, you know, there was, there's Louie. Um, several of the bar owners in Atlanta that were in, you know, involved with very popular bars like Illusions, which was an awesome show bar, and Crazy Rays, uh, Ted Binkley, and, um, also, Dina Collins, who is an incredible woman. They're, Ted and Dina are still around, both of them. Uh, they're both getting into their 80s. So we know 
we've got to capture their stories now. But um, great people, you know, there's a lot of them. Um, Scott Nocton from um, Pegasus, Eagle, and Pittsburgh. Um, Bev Cook and Bev McMahon, who both ran very successful bars in Atlanta. Uh, Joe Marcello. I don't know if you've ever heard of a club called Mecca in Miami, but um, mm -hmm. Mecca was this huge entertainment complex, like 35,000 square feet of five different bar setups, um, amazing bar in, in Miami. And he also still operates Marcello's in Buffalo, New York. So uh, it's been great hearing their stories, though. They all have something to say about why they got into the business, what's rewarding about it. Uh, how much they love that people still remember that you know the bar, how important the bars were to them. So it's it's been a great experience. Now, um, is there a way for do you are you in need of financial support for your project? Is there a way that people can support the project if they want to? What kind of support do you need to uh, bring this to well, the right, level wouldn't... of what you envision? It wouldn't hurt. It takes a lot of time to put together all this information. Uh, one thing I have done is on almost all of the bars, uh, especially the ones that are, are long gone and have no um, no protections at all, um, I've created a whole line of T-shirts um, that have the commemorative designs on them. So people can buy a T-shirt that's, you know, the bar where they met their husband or the first bar that they went to or whatever. And, um, you know, that helps too. But, um, is that at the there, wow.biz? There's links to it. Actually, if you go to the, but, the but what is the direct, what is the direct link to where the t-shirts are? Oh, that's okay. If it's not simple, the best way is for people to just go to gaybarchives.com. Right, and then if they click on the word archives in the top, that lists yes. the that lists them by that lists the state and how many uh, listings they have, and each of those state names links to the state's collection. So they're collected by state also on the website. Okay, that's good to know. I just wanted to, uh, the viewers to be able to know that. And by the way, there... I created a dis I created a discount code today. Um, snow, S-N-O-W, that will get anybody 15% off if they use that code when they go to checkout. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I'm going to put that on the screen. I don't think I've ever been a discount code before, and people, when they use it, won't know it's me. They're going to think that it's, so, uh, you know, that frozen, fluffy stuff. Right. Uh, snow Although we know you have gone out. We know you've gone out on Halloween as over six feet of snow, so. Yes, that's one of my hit. And I always like to say over six feet of snow has hit your internet experience. Uh, uh, just a second, linked from. Okay, how is that correct? Yes. Okay, I'm going to edit it slightly because of some grammar in there. But um, so, uh, what's next for you? I don't know. I think the next thing that's going to—it's starting to go into production now—is um, an actual uh, video series on Channel One Twenty Five. And what we're going to be doing is, in each segment, we will be talking about one of the bars in the collection or a related group of bars. Um, and so we'll talk about a little bit more in depth about the history of the bar, um, memories that people have about it, and whenever possible, have a video interview with an owner, manager of the bar that can tell us a little bit more about what it was like back then. Um, in some cases, I have some vintage video that I can include um, in those segments. So basically, we'll be, we'll be making a whole like biography channel, if you will, of um, gay bars from the past, and anybody is well, welcome to contribute. Well, and a shout out to Dick. A shout out to Dick Wolfie for his uh, decades of work with Channel One Twenty Five dot com, as well. Yeah, he's done a great is job. There, 
Is there anything you would like to talk about that we haven't yet addressed in our interview? Well, I just want to make it clear that, you know, a lot of people have talked about um, the concept of bars. I've got a little bit of negative feedback from some people saying, you know, you shouldn't be focusing on the alcohol aspect of our of our culture. And, you know, as you can attest yourself, it's not about the alcohol. In fact, quite a number of the clubs uh, that were out there were more of after-hours type clubs that didn't even serve alcohol. But the point was that, that at that time, in the 70s and 80s especially, they were our safe haven. And so those memories that come flooding back, when I think of my days going to Backstreet at 3 or 4 in the morning and staying there until 9 or 10, they're not about the alcohol. They're about seeing friends, dancing, having a good time, watching Charlie Brown do her incredible shows on stage. It, it's not about the alcohol. And um, I just want to make that clear that, you know, this, this was really our social centers. These were our safe havens. It wasn't necessarily a place everybody went to get drunk. It was no that it was that was not why people went to the gay bars. They could go to absolutely. any bar if that's what they wanted. And you know, I have almost two decades of recovery, and I can't blame a bar or alcohol on my right. own issues. And I, that thought has never crossed my mind, actually. And as a matter of fact, um, we owe it. We owe the bars our community. Because that is how we found each other. That is how we connected. That is how we became who we are on a greater level and created the world at which in which we um, can be ourselves in certain places in the world. There's still horrible problems in other places in the world. And I do believe that none of us are free until all of us are free. And we need to continue lifting each other up across the board including for black and brown and disenfranchised folks. I'm making it a commitment in my own show to do that. Um, but yes, and, and also, uh, Art, are you uncovering the role of uh, drag in bars and their specific connection to the amazing f philanthropic activity that's funded so much of our political and civil rights efforts and the fight against HIV and AIDS? Yes, not only... Um not only the drag aspect of it, but there are numerous communities. Uh, one thing you'll find when you, you know, once we get all the information documented is that bars like um, what I what I like to call men's bars, um, the Eagle and their um, their siblings and, and relatives that were specifically designed for, you know, manly men, which of course you couldn't get away with doing now. Um, but those bars were very involved also in fundraising. Um, but like I said, the very first project I did with the t-shirts was a Backstreet project. And that project benefited the Atlanta Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, who are still doing those kind of things uh, to support you know, LGBT causes and, and AIDS research and things like that. So yes, there, there is information about that, um, about how some of the bar owners were very important to uh, the community. They almost became like mother hands or, or, you know, daddies to the gay community because they were so concerned about the well-being of their of their patrons. Uh, different than it is today. You know, today most of the time you walk into a bar, you may or may not know the owner, but you don't feel a family relationship with them. Back then, they were family. Oh, totally, totally. Uh, to quote Sister Sledge, we are family. <laughs> um, Art, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. I'm really glad that this finally happened and that we've created this piece of archival footage. Uh, my archives is going to the one archives at the USC libraries. That's where my body of work is going to ultimately land. But I really appreciate all that you're doing. And uh, do you have a final remark? Yeah, if you want to, if you want to be more involved, or any of your viewers want to be more involved, you can do your own selfie video talking about your favorite bar from the past, and then email me or send me a message through my uh, website, and 
I can collect those video clips and use them in upcoming segments. So you can actually tell your story on video about the bar that you remember, whether it was in Tucson or it was in Orlando or wherever it was. You know, I can I can weave those into the episodes that we're going to do on the Gate Archive Show for Channel One Twenty Five. Um. I'm going to be a television producer for a second and add some information to that. And then you can correct me if you have a different style in mind. But if you're going to be producing your own videos of your home, uh, my suggestion for for you is to put your phone in landscape as opposed to portrait. Make sure that you have more light shining on your face than you do behind you. And if you can get permission, and if you're talking about a bar that currently exists... Why not do the footage at the bar? But would you like to add anything, Art, uh, or give even different information than I have about maximizing the quality of those video submissions should they come in? No, that's excellent. Horizontal video is very important. Um, and of course, the lighting. If you don't have the opportunity to do lighting uh, in the house for whatever reason, you can do it outside. You can sit out on your front porch or you know, natural light works for great too. But, well, uh, you actually don't. The iPhones, modern phones are so fantastic with their built-in yeah. lighting filters. The key is that wherever you're doing your, footing, your, your shooting, you want to have more light in front of you than you do behind Absolutely. you. Other than that, you're going to be fine. Well, uh, once again, uh, congratulations. I do have a, a question that I love to ask people that I interview. And I was wondering... Was there a particular moment in your life that was a turning point in which you decided to truly honor who you are and the life that you wanted to live? So is that question referring more to the coming out aspect? Or more no, to... that, that, that has to do with whatever moment it was or, or circumstance that, that realized, oh, I have one life to live. This is it. I'm going for it. And this is what I'm focused on. And I'm not stopping. So I guess that was about the same time that I took over the magazine in Atlanta. Uh, before then, I had done some sales and marketing jobs. And um, at that time, when I took over the magazine, I realized that it was kind of a happy place, that I, I was much better working for myself than I was, you know, punching a time clock or showing up on a specific schedule. And um, that being allowed to be a more social and open person made it much better for me. So I, I guess at that point, I would have been around late 20s, 29, 28. Um, when I decided that that was the route to take as opposed to, you know, the IBM white shirt and blue tie concept. Floyd Taylor says, this is absolutely amazing. So many memories. Thank you for that. Well, comment. Sarah, do, do, me, Floyd. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Floyd wants uh, uh, art. Floyd wants, excuse me, Art wants you to share your memories with him, which we've talked about. You can just go to the, the website we've been promoting throughout the show. There's, there's yes. also, by the way, a gay archives group on Facebook that I just started. So if you search groups on Facebook for gay archives, you'll find a group there and you can post pictures and video clips and whatever you want on there with your memories from the bars too. Fantastic. And I want to invite uh anyone who's watching this oh by the way floyd says he will share his memories with you um i want to invite anybody who's watching this episode to share it widely it's on youtube it's on facebook uh within two days it will be on uh the promo homo tv instagram page under the igd uh, Insta igtv platform and of course it's at promohomo.tv and i know art you're very prolific in sharing so I'm trusting you to share this episode to all those Facebook groups that you told me that you were uh, connected with. I absolutely will. Well, thank you, Art, for being on the show. It's really an honor to know you and keep up the good work. Well, thank you. You're welcome. For everyone who's been watching, I really appreciate your support of Promo Homo TV. I love doing what I'm doing, and I love that you're on the ride with me. One of the things I really loved about uh, the most recent episode that I did was that I had people watching from start to finish who were participating in the show 
um, from Canada, from Thailand, from the Philippines, from Texas. Uh, it was an international conversation uh, sort of, uh, focused around my live guest. That was, for me, exciting television. So thanks, thanks to you who have the opportunity to watch live when I'm live. But whenever you watch, I appreciate it. And I'll see you next time. You win me, it's all right, together on our lives.